I'm going to do a slightly unusual thing today. I'm going to talk about, um, well, I'm going to begin with the death mask of Oliver Cromwell, which I've chosen from all the um, exhibits owned by the Ashmolean. Couldn't get the actual mask because it was hidden away in Swindon or something. Um, but I want to show, talk about the ma this mask because of how it speaks to what I also want to speak about tonight, which is the deathly afterlives of Shakespeare's Macbeth. Now, a few um, very unscholarly remarks about uh, Oliver Cromwell, um, who's a very strange, difficult figure, I think, in, in British history. I, and I see him, as an Australian, I see him as something like Britain's repressed imaginary, a kind of um, annihilated alternative parent. Now, one of the notorious things about Macbeth, as many of you will know, is the superstition about saying its name. It's got to be called the Scottish play or whatever. And the idea that to, 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 to do otherwise would bring down a curse. And something similar, I think, holds for Cromwell. Um, in some other world, an alternative world, he could be this land's founding father. Instead, he's barely mentioned. Um, nobody seems to own him or admit him as their inspiration. He studied in school courses, of course, but um, he's folded into courses about the Stuarts, or his period of rule is dismissed as an interregnum. Everything is framed by the idea of monarchy. Um, I think he's fatally unsuited to our times, or what we like to think of as our times. He's a king killer, he's a usurper, by fate a Republican but never a Democrat. He's a Puritan, commanded by unswerving faith in Providence, all very un-English. He's also the agent of genocide, notoriously in Ireland. You might think exceptionally so, but when in fact many more and possibly far worse slaughters were sanctioned by the sainted Elizabeth. Anyway, he's a curious figure, but here he is, safely dead. Or is he? Because what do we have here? We have here Cromwell's death mask. Now what is it? Is it the face of a man? The face of a dead man? The face of life? Or the face of death? Is it the face of life after death? Or is it no face at all, and rather a plaster cast, a piece of art, carrying the trace of what Macbeth calls the secret man of blood, waiting, haunting the future, waiting perhaps to be ignited into life? I mean, I'm just moving into sort of an imaginary realm myself there. Now, in all of this, I want to suggest Cromwell is a sort of shadow of Macbeth. He's, the, 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 as I said, the repressed imaginary, the tyrant and butcher, this Macbeth, we pretend is other to everything we hold dear, who we pretend is dead and buried, never to be re repeated or to return. But then look at that death mask. Isn't it watching and waiting? There's one later. Where is it? There's Tom's... I'll come back to them, but there's another image here. You get a different perspective on it. It looks to me like he's sort of quietly smiling waiting for something, even now. Now think about Macbeth, the play. Now nothing in Macbeth is safely buried. The plays begin with reports of a fearsome battle that the captain says was like another Golgotha. Golgotha is the place, of course, of uh, Calvary, of Christ's crucifixion, but also it's the place of dead men's skulls. Now that, that phrase, another Golgotha, seems to both describe and prescribe the actual scene of the play's action, a place of dead men's skulls. So this, is, this, is, this is the actual topography, the geography of Macbeth. But it's another Golgotha, the dead return. Crucifixion delivers resurrections of the most terrifying kind. The play ends with another dead man's skull, Macduff holding up and saying, Behold where stands the usurper's cursed head. The time is free. So says Macduff. But is the time free? He says the head stands. And it's a very strange word. How can a head stand? It's as though given its own uncanny automatism like some sort of Pixar animation. And what in fact is held up to us? Some hoary old theatrical prop. A papier mache confection filled with pig's blood or turnip peel or something. In place of a corpse, we get a death's mask. Now where Macbeth is, the supposedly dead character, who can say? He doesn't die on stage. Is he dead at all? I'll just read a, a, a little quote from um, a famous moment from Macbeth when he says, this is during Banquo's, um, uh, Banquo's, you know, when Banquo's ghost appears at the feast, and he says, 
The time has been that when the brains were out, the man would die, and there an end. But now they rise again, with 20 mortal murders on their crowns, and push us from our stools. So might the death mask rise again? Now it's this kind of thinking that's helped to inspire a book that's just about to be published of mine called Macbeth, Macbeth, um, which I've written with you and Fernie, and which features uh, pictures, illustrations by Tom de Freston, who's just down there, um, published by Bloomsbury, which is a repetition and sequel of Macbeth, which imagines that the porter has three children who grow up to repeat in very different ways the story of Macbeth. Now, I want to read now just a couple of two or three short extracts from the novel, which traces the passage of Macbeth's severed head, his undead face, his unkillable skull, seeing it as a kind of mask of death that haunts and tempts and shades into every character in the story. So I'll read, I'll read three extracts. The first one is early in the book when the porter wakes up on the morning after the battle. The porter had woken in the allotments to the back of the castle, slung in the middle of an enormous compost heap. He rubbed his eyes and scratched and spat. Down below, he could see the branches the invaders carried before them, lying across the field like bones that refused interment. The sight of that wood nearly killed him. He started a wobbly jog, balancing on the raw balls of his feet, and within minutes was surrounded by trees. Burnham Wood felt wrong, thinner and more exposed than he liked. He glanced up, feebly self-aware, sure that some hard-eyed corvine would be laughing at him. But instead of a bird, he saw a strange object, leaning at angles in a nearby ash. It was a long wooden pole, roughly lathed, foreign oak, tossed in the tree's tangled branches. He started to pull the pole from the tree. But as he did so, something snagged on the boughs. He jiggled it about and it became free. The pole was astonishingly heavy. The porter almost toppled back as he stared at his find, for stuck fast to the top of the pole was the head of his master. It was his king, right there, exactly as he always was. The porter bowed with something like awe. He had to remember how to face his master. He had to do it right. He slid the pole between his legs and drew the severed head close to his thighs. Right, sir, he said briskly, shut each eyelid, bending forward to kiss both in turn. He yanked the head sideways and pulled it clear. He looked gravely into its face, holding the look for three or four blinks. Then he carried it away, stroking its massive bulk, his cheeks soaked with tears, babbling as though to a newborn child. He shuffled out to the sacred storehouse. He had never before entered this hallowed space. A fear rose in his stomach as he fumbled with the key. It turned heavily and the porter moved inside the darkness. The sepulchre smelled obscenely of polecat. He crouched toward the earth, slow and blind, his actions someone else's. Why was this earth so wet? He didn't understand. The skull slipped from his fingers and plopped dumbly aground. He felt a horror rising inside. He wasn't up to this. His body was paralyzed and he was too scared to speak. What words can speak for the dead? Master, he whispered, and kissing his fist, the porter fumbled to bless the skull. It was slimy to the touch and invisible, not of this world at all. My he started to speak again, but his mouth was parched and the words choked on him. He was never trained for such duties. He was a porter, a porter, and there were trespasses too far. He stumbled for the door and returned, panicking into light, crossing himself like a fool. And then later on, there's a battle, and a particular moment in the battle. I'm just going to go right to the, to the end of the battle, and a particular moment. The field looked peeled, as though the rind had been taken off the world. It could almost have been beautiful, gorgeous vermilion, the carmine of love, a return to hopes long lost, but it was not. Scotland's skin was all torn off. Everything was painted wounds. Sod's eyes looked upon such scarlet, such savage scarlet, as though hills or green or wild thyme had never been. He sank down and picked up with his fingers a flung free human organ. He didn't know what it was, a kidney, a liver, a heart. It was so spongy and innocent that tears welled in Sod's eyes. He touched his cheek with the organ. It was very warm and wet like a burnished cauliflower. He caressed his cheek with a fist-shaped thing and kissed its dappled tissue. It reminded him of something lost. He couldn't quite think what. 
Sod kissed it again and held it to his temple like a wetly loving compress. It wasn't a vegetable at all, he thought. It was stone before the great freeze. Its mottles were holes where the feeling gets in. He recalled his stony master and all his stony gifts. And indeed, if you squinted at it, the organ did look a little bit like Macbeth's face. That fierce red thing burning with desire. He kissed it once more and was sure he felt it kissing him back. Holding the organ to his cheek, Sod gently allowed the surroundings back into sight. Next to him was a boy's body. He must have been no more than ten. His head was still on his shoulders, but the skull had been split in two. Inside the skull was a chasm of black nothing, like an emptied pomegranate. He looked around and saw a thousand other such unliving things, limbs and organs thrown across the plain as though creation was yet to come, and here were its constituents, just waiting to be stitched into form. But ah, we thought, my needle is long lost. He looked again at the little organ. He traced one capillary after another. Such care, such complexity. Who made life so fugitive and delicate and tenacious? Who could have thought of such a thing? He stared sorrowfully at the boy lying brainless next to him. He looked from the corpse to the organ, from the organ to the corpse, feeling more maudlin by the moment. This poor little organ, homeless and lost. And that lovely young boy with his emptied head. And then it clicked. This is where the boy had gone. Here he is, thought Sod, right in my palm, warm and entire and invincible. All of memory was here. He looked at the boy's brain and felt the dizziest kind of wonder, so beautiful and so dead. And then the final one I want to read is a short bit from, um, it's one of Tom's uh, pictures for the book. This is a little bit later, just after the same battle, when another fellow, one of, one of the sons of, sons of the porter emerges. A low rumble came from the clouds. The very air shuddered and rank upon rank of snow was released. The snow fell straight down and sidelong, instantly blanketing the dead and the dying. For, for a few moments, the swirl of flakes took soft and condoling shapes like pity's children. But soon enough, nothing could be distinguished from anything else. The snow stopped, the air was empty, and except for the carrion crows perched high in the trees, the Scottish scene was an entire annihilated white. It was some hours later when Lulac stepped from his litter, box in hand, and began walking like a wraith across the snow. In the trees perched more and more birds, raptors made circles in the whitened sky. Lulac saw nothing human. The snow crunched as his legs fell. Deep beneath the snow, the dandelions breathed on as weeds will. Lulac knelt in the snow. He lifted the lid of the box and placed both hands inside. And then his words were echoing across the silence. The time has been that when the brains were out, the man would die and there an end, but now they rise again. Lulac rose to his feet a large grey-white sphere in his hands. He lifted his arms high and brought the object slowly down to his crown. He pulled hard and his health felt alarmingly soft. He was jamming a huge skull around his ears. Though his head was large, the skull was still larger. His head contorted as the skull was forced down. The flesh beneath the hair was pressed into small, tumour-shaped bubbles. His head felt spongy and yielding as a newborn's. His face turned pink with the effort and his ears felt murdered. An egg of doughy flesh was pressed out through a slat in the cranium. He pulled harder still and the skull shut down over chin and jaw, encasing his head like a giant helmet. The bone was awesomely chiseled. Through the nose bone was a large rusted ring encrusted with a tiny coral-like necklace of white growth. Lulac's brain felt violently compressed and he could barely move his mouth. His face was fat beneath the bone. The skull jammed into cheek and jaw like a vice. Only around his eyes and his temples was there any release. Only there could air circulate and function as if normal. But of course, nothing was normal. There was no such thing as normal. Everywhere was locked violence. Lulac stumbled across the snow, his flesh pale and huge, his burning eyes encased 
in the brain pan of Macbeth. Thank you.